Thanks for having me again, man. It's good talking with you. Absolutely. It's great to have you on the show. Welcome to the show. Um, my name's Luke. I'm joined here by Adley Sunshine Edwards today. It's great to have you on the show. Um, you made your return to professional MMA after a little over a year off last week. We've got a lot to talk about today. So welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about the injury. We're going to start off with the bad news that hit you in July of last year and take us from there. So start with that. What happened to you July of last year? Yeah, I got banged up in training. It was one of those old injuries that uh, I've been kind of dealing with for a while. And, uh, you know, I had to make a tough call. It was at the point where I, I really couldn't do much. And uh, I had that big opportunity on Contender Series. But, you know, Dana White's looking for big, exciting finishes. And uh, not only was I nervous that, uh, you know, would maybe be able to perform as well as I could, but I was nervous that even if I did and I got the contract, you know, I'd be so injured I wouldn't even be able to have a turnaround and fight. Unfortunately, I didn't know that uh, that layoff would end up – that pulling from that fight would end up being an 18-month total layoff for me because uh, I couldn't get a fight in the winter when I was healthy. And then COVID hit the spring, and then here we are, and I finally only just now got a fight back. Absolutely. So you said you felt like you could have fought in December. So about how long did it take you to rehab from that injury that pulled you out of the Dana White Contender Series? Uh, I felt like I was ready enough to, to perform, maybe not my best, but I was able to fight in December and this winter. And I, by the springtime, I was good to go. You know, that injury took me a long time to recover from, but to be honest, it was something I was dealing with for a long time. And it might have been a blessing in disguise because now it's, it's not even a thing anymore. It's something that's plagued my entire career, and now I'm, I'm past it, and I feel so much better. I'm moving better, feeling powerful and explosive and and movements that I never could do. And I'm, I'm sorry, you'll hear my dog moaning in the background here. But it's fine. That's fine. It just adds to the interview. Well, since, yeah, you just had, sorry. Yeah, since you just had a fight camp, um, and obviously you fought about eight, nine days ago, you said you felt better in that fight camp. What was it like to be uh, free of this injury for your first fight camp in a while to not have that injury? Awesome, man. Easy, smooth. I felt explosive. I felt dangerous. I just – didn't have to fight with uh, the fear of being hurt uh, in a camp. In a fight, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to bite down my mouthpiece. We're going to get after I'm going to find a way to win. Mm -hmm. But uh, in camp, you know, you don't want to make things worse. You don't want to be re-aggravating. And it, and it was nice to be able to train without that fear. And I, I felt better than I ever have. It, it was really a, a big change for me. Well, you feeling better than you ever had turned into a finish by Tico in under a minute. So there's not a lot there, but walk us through that no. fight. You went down to Myrtle Beach, uh, and you had a fight, which is congratulations to that promotion to be able to put on an event during all the COVID stuff. So there you are. You're down in Myrtle Beach. What was it like to have that fight go? What was it like getting back into it? It was good, man, and it's to back up a step. When I was trying to get a, a fight, I, uh, I ran into the problem where there wasn't any promotions, really, especially nothing locally. And, uh, you know, I reached out to that promotion. They were doing mostly amateur fights, and they told me they uh, couldn't get me on there. And then Derek Brunson, who uh, runs the promotion, reached out to me personally and uh, made it happen. And it was, it was – I'm really grateful for him because, you know, I'm trying to show the UFC and everybody else out there that I'm, I'm still here despite this layoff. So I was just desperate to get back in there and compete. And uh, getting out there and getting after it, it was – I'll tell you what, it, it, obviously I'm glad I got a win. I'm glad I got a finish and uh, it looked good or whatever, but I'm, I miss competing. And I was very unsatisfied after a, a sub minute performance. I have like 18 months of built up competitive energy that I want to release. And I usually feel like some satisfaction after a win. And I just was like, we're not done here. So, you know, it was, uh, I'm glad I have another one in the books uh, shortly afterwards. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about that. I uh, let's back up a little bit. Derek Brunson, the UFC fighter at 185, he runs that. He runs that promotion it, that you were saying. He runs that promotion in Myrtle Beach. Yes, sir. Yes, what sir. Was it, I think, what, what I think was it was only fight? their fourth. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, sir. I said I think it was only their, their fourth ever show. So I think they're still trying to figure out the ropes of how to make it work, and especially in this post-COVID world. So yeah, it was wild. But there were, I think, originally up until fight week, I think 25 fights on the card, 15 amateur, 10 pros. It's a massive card. Uh, yeah. I think by fight time, I think only two dropped out. I think they had 23 fights. So it was a lot of fights. So they got a lot of regional guys from action, which is, which is really cool. 
Yeah, that's huge. I actually was looking that up and was shocked that it was a 23 fight uh, card in, in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, amateur slash pro cards are limited to 14 fights, which I think can be a bit short at times, you know, depending on the situation. 23 fights sounds like. What was it like since you were the main event? Um, how long was that? Is that like a three and a half, four hour show? What was it like to be behind the well, scenes for that long? You know what? They, they had even jiu-jitsu matches before the, the MMA fights. So it was, and I think they had some exhibition kickboxing as well, if I remember right. Oh, wow. um, so I think they started at one o'clock with the jiu-jitsu matches. MMA started at four, or the, the, the kickboxing or whatever they had was at four, and then they rolled on through there. So, you know, after I weighed in at the fighters meeting, luckily it was on the beach, so I just sat outside and enjoyed the, the weather and just waited for the locker room to clear out. So I, missed, I missed a lot of the action there. I, I wasn't able to see a whole lot, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it seemed pretty busy, that's for sure. Was that one of your more unique uh, venues? I, I know a lot of amateur and pro um, regional fighters end up fighting in some pretty unique venues. Was that the closest you've ever been to the beach? It sounds like a pretty nice environment. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose so. It was nice definitely having that scenery, especially this time of the year. And we haven't been to the beach this summer, so it was nice, right. uh, nice seeing the waves and the ocean. You know, I like that sort of stuff. It was definitely scenic. But... Um, yeah, it, it was definitely a, a cool venue, I guess, in that sense, especially with the, the background and the setting. It was nice. Absolutely. Well, transitioning to your next fight, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show because it was disappointing, obviously, for you to not be able to fight for Dana White Contender Series last year and then the pandemic and the 18-month layoff. But now you've got a quick turnaround and you're going to be fighting for an open 145-pound belt for Hard Rock MMA in, I believe it's in Kentucky? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it, it, Kentucky. yeah, absolutely. So obviously that's kind of a, a more well-known promotion. It's, there's a belt on the line. When did that get signed? How long have you known that that was going to be your next fight there, November 6th? Oof, uh, maybe three weeks ago. Okay. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. I think two weeks left in my last, in my last camp. They, uh, they set that up. And, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that. They, their last champion, I know it's open now, just got signed with the UFC. Um, so I know they're, uh, you know, the, the UFC knows about them and, uh, my opponent actually was on contender series too. So hopefully they, they're, uh, they're here to watch and see this. I think it's going to be a high level fight, uh, for, especially for the regional scene. So hopefully this is, uh, what they're, uh, what they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's really great. Um, I had spoken to Lance last year when he was on Dana White contender series, because that's your opponent. And it's great to see this quality of matchup that really could be happening and I would say should be happening in the UFC. You're 7-1. and one. I believe his record is still 5-1. and one. Um, That's what his record was. It might have bumped up. I'm not sure. Um, but what's it like knowing that this is uh, at least a UFC caliber fight, even if you're not in the promotion yet? It's good, man. This is what I'm here for. I want to fight the best guys. Uh, obviously, I want to do it in the UFC where I'm getting a UFC uh, – money and recognition and all that stuff with it, of course. But um, at the end of the day, that's why I do it, is to fight. And uh, I want to fight good guys. And Lance seems like a durable, quality, tough opponent. And uh, I'm ready to have somebody showcase my skills with. Absolutely. And it'll be great, I think, like what you were saying, you felt unsatisfied to have an under-minute fight. Uh, going in, going into this fight, what would your expectations be for what you want to do? Not so much for what he does because you can't control him, but for what you're going to do. I want to go out there and perform the way, uh, you know, I, I want the world to see that I'm, I'm performing at a UFC level. I want Dana White to see that. I want every fan to see that. I want people to see a high-level fighter there. And I, I think that Lance, uh, I know he said, don't put a, you know, what he's going to do. But I do, I will say he's durable. He's tough, and he'll keep coming. So I think, uh, you know, he's going to give me a lot of opportunities to showcase my skills. He's not going to crumble under there uh, at the first sign of danger. So I think we're going to have an exciting, explosive fight, and I, I think it's going to be awesome. I really think it's going to be a good chance to show everything I'm capable of. Absolutely. And you bring up a good point that, and this has been coming up on the Dana White Contender Series this, uh, this summer, is that, whoever you're fighting, uh, for you to look your best, they have to bring something. You know, they have to be, they, they have to be bringing something for you to then 
uh, show, showcase your thing. Speaking mm -hmm. of Dana White Contender Series, they're restarting uh, the same week, they're restarting the Tuesday that you're going to be fighting that Friday. So mm -hmm. it seems like there's not a full season yet, but it seems like they'll be running going forward past November, December. Um, obviously, we're not matchmaking here, but you already had a fight in Myrtle Beach when you knew another fight was coming up. So what would it be like? Would you be looking for a good turnaround in December if they were still doing Dana White uh, in December? Because it looks like they might be. Yeah, I mean, I'll take it. But to be honest with you, I, uh, I want to get past the regional competition. I want to fight the best in the world. I'm hoping they – I mean, Lance was on Contender Series the same year I was supposed to be on there. We were, like, going to compete a couple weeks apart. Yep. To me, it's like, hey, this is a Contender Series fight right here. Hopefully they see it as that, and this is my tryout. I really hope they uh, – they can see this quality of, of opposition as obviously contender series worthy. Cause if our opponents had to, you know, swap out, I'm sure we'd have matched together. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping they just say, Hey, this dude's ready. Obviously let's put him in the UFC. Well, that's, what I, that's what I'm hoping. I want to skip contender. I want to get right in there and make some moves. I'm thrilled that you said that it's great to get your mindset and I apologize for making it seem like your next level would be Dana White Contender Series. No, 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 of course, right. of course. You I should mean, be I... able to just jump right in. And um, with where they are right now, it looks like they're open to people who want to fight because the, the pandemic is still changing things. Um, have you ever fought in your MMA career or your collegiate wrestling career outside of the United States? I have not. I have not. I've only competed in the U.S. I would love to, to, to compete internationally. That would be awesome. I have uh, – you know, I love traveling. I've got family all over the world. And, hey, man, any excuse to, uh, to go see some new sites would be awesome with me. I, I would love the opportunity. Well, do you have family in Abu Dhabi? Because it looks like they're, they're uh -huh. using Fight Island some more, you know? Which... Yeah. I would love to be over there, man. That, that would be awesome. That would be really cool. I think cool. – uh, that would be a, a fantastic opportunity. I was really hoping that uh, this summer they would give me a call up for a last minute fight. I knew I was on the radar, so I was, right. I was staying ready and I'll wait, hoping. And uh, same thing right now. If they need a last minute fight, I'm their guy. I, and I don't want to ask anything confidential here. Um, would your contract for Hard Rock allow you to jump? Absolutely. You... Okay. Absolutely. That was a, that was a, a deal breaker for sure because that's our end goal. We want to make sure we're getting up there. And because I, I interview a lot of regional fighters, that's one of the things Sorry. I, I do uh -oh. quite a bit on this show, is can you talk to me a little bit um, about the difficulty regional fighters sometimes have to get contracts that make sense for where they are? Like, obviously, shout out to Hard Rock for giving you a contract that allows you to go to the UFC if that's, you know, if, if that comes up, because it could happen between now and November 6th. But... Um, have you run into any difficulties as a regional fighter with promoters that don't really see that, that aren't really giving what I guess I could call fighter-friendly um, contracts? Um, I, ha I haven't dealt with that, to be honest. Okay. I've made sure that that was always the case because, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I'm going for. Sure. But, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, really, to be honest, other than regional pay, and I guess, I mean, their hands are obviously tied by, right. especially right now, with you can't sell a lot of tickets during COVID and – you know, whatever the case may be. But uh, no, most promoters have been understanding of this position. And luckily, I've been lucky. Most promotions I fought in have um, – sorry, there's some background noise. My kids are running around the back there. Um, uh, most of my promotions, the last few, are fighter-owned. The mm -hmm. fight that I just had was with Brunson. This next one, I think Chris Lytle is a part of the promotion team. Before, that was Kevin Guitar's promotion. So these guys know the game. They've been – They've been in here doing it, and they, uh, they, they know what the dream is. And I guess talk a little bit more about that, because the fighter own, I feel like because MMA is still under 30 years old, it's in like the 26, 27 years, and regional promotions are still coming along. Um, what do you see as significant for fighters? I mean, Derek Brunson's still competing. If people remember Chris Lights Out, Light Over, they should. He's a legend. Um, but – What's it like to, to see what former or current UFC fighters are now making the transition to promoters? Have you been able to see what that looks like compared to maybe non-former uh, fighter promoters? I'm just curious asking from your experience. Yeah, I think, that, I, I think yeah, they get it. They're not trying to um, – I mean, they got to make money, and they know it's business, of course. And I think uh, 
they uh, they understand like the the, the plight of the fight the fighter. You know what what we have to go through the difficulties. Um, so they're a little more understanding. But I also think they also don't have patience, probably just as normal promoters do for fighters who aren't doing what they need to do. Yeah. Especially these fighters who made a career out of it, did it by doing the right things, being professional. Mm. So uh, yeah, I, I actually prefer it. I think it's I would rather fight for promotions run by fighters. I think it's a good way to keep the community running and, and uh, spiraling in, in an upward direction here. I, I bet like what you're right, there's a, there's a positive, obviously, like you're pointing out, but I bet for some fighters that maybe make up excuses or like you say, don't do their weight cut right or aren't professional, I bet dealing with uh, Derek Brunson or Chris Lytle, they're not going to take that crap because they've been there in situations. They know what the profession's like, so that's great. Yeah. Speaking of profession, most of the fighters I interview that are still fighting on the regional uh, level are bivocational. They do a job in addition to fighting. What's that like for you? Obviously, you haven't fought for 18 months uh, until last week. So what have you been able to do career-wise or, or what do you have going on uh, job-wise for you? Yeah, uh, I'm actually a strength and conditioning coach. I run a, my own strength and conditioning programs, mostly for combat athletes. Um, a lot of jiu-jitsu guys, Muay Thai guys, a couple of local MMA fighters. And then I work at another gym, uh, 36 Chambers. It's made 15 minutes from my house. Mm-hmm. Teach MMA classes, athletic performance classes. So that's what I do. My wife actually um, just started joining, working with me as well. She got certified. So we've got a, a nice uh, uh, setup here. I, and I really am uh, enjoying the workflow, to be honest. It's not too bad. As far as uh, jobs that complement, I guess, fighter lifestyle, uh, you, you can't get too too bad with that. No, it's certainly great. I, I, I know some of the fighters I interview have jobs that are completely outside of MMA. A lot of them trades jobs or labor jobs. Um, being connected to something related to strength and conditioning and training. Um, are there times where you benefit from what you're teaching to other people? Or are there times that you feel kind of burned out? Where are you on the year around fighting or training or athletics all the time, do you think it's an advantage to you? Do you think there's times where you'd like a painting a house job so that your brain could be off of it? Just compare those two. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I never burn out. Okay. Strangely enough, I love it. I, you know, I, I eat, breathe, dream, everything MMA. I, my mind's always into it. And uh, it's nice being able to, to coach people and train people, even when they're, they're, they're beginners and it's more fundamental and basic. And that's just important, and it helps reinforce it, helps you to say it. And when you're a coach, you know, you don't want to have people do what you say, but do what you do. So it, it lets you help lead by example. I, I enjoy it. I want to be all in with this. And when I'm done competing, I want to coach. I, I love this. This is a great sport. I think there's a lot to be learned from it and, and lifestyle, and I want to share that with other people. Absolutely. It's a great mindset and attitude you have. Speaking of sports, I know you were an All-American wrestler. Um, in your collegiate days, what, what did you bring the most? We're jumping back, but what did you bring the most from that all American wrestler mindset that has still continued on as where you are now? Oh, uh, I had this coach, uh, my college coach, Tim Durland. He was, he was a beast. I think he was number one in the Olympic ladder for a while. And he always had this quote. And honestly, I think he stole that quote from somebody else, but uh, he said, you got to, you got to like it tough, not just kind of tough. And that was like our motto of our wrestling team in mm-hmm. college. And I live by that. I love, I love the grind. I want the challenge. And um, a lot of people don't have that because they don't get brought up in that kind of culture and environment. And our wrestling team was, you know, we had great athletes. We had tough guys. And that brings out a sort of drive you need to push through hard workouts and adversity. That I don't think a lot of guys have. And I take that with me. And of course, all the the skills from wrestling and, you know, training in that, in that sort of environment with other athletes, of course. But, but that toughness, I think, is the number one thing I, I, I took away from it. Absolutely. And speaking of toughness, and I know I'm going back to your college days, but I found an interview with you online about talking about becoming an All-American in the blood rounds, and you went to triple overtime. So oh, yeah. and you were at Elevation in Pueblo, uh, Colorado. So – uh, just just refresh the, the fans that might not know that background. What was it like being pushed to that limit? That's really the do or die, the difference between being an All-American and not. Um, and then physically going to the absolute limits of what you could do and then getting the pin. What was that like for you 
um, even though that's a thing in the past now. Yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago, to be honest. I feel like I'm telling somebody else's story now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was tough, man. I had, uh, just like any wrestling season, come out banged, beat up, <laughs> broken. Um, just got off of a uh, re injury retro year that year. And uh, it was one of those things where, like, they're like, you should take, like, six months off. And we took, like, two months off. So I came back halfway through the season, all banged up. And, um, yeah, I had this dude, uh, he was tough. He was the national runner-up the year before. So he got second in the country. And then the year after we competed, I'm sorry, somebody keeps texting me here. And uh, the, uh, the year after we competed, he ended up winning a national title. So he was a great athlete. And he was from Colorado. So we're competing at his hometown. And we went through uh, – I started off strong, three, uh, three takedowns, I think, to zero, had the riding time. And, man, the elevation was brutal, and he was tough. And that, he ended up coming back, and we had to fight through to triple overtime. And uh, that, was, that was a gut check for sure. They made me earn that All-American title. Uh, that, was, that was a rough round, one of my favorite matches. You know, he's getting the flow, getting the zone. I'm hitting takedowns I've never hit before. I've never seen anybody else hit before. You're making stuff up. And it was just a fun, you know, really – hard fought victory and I I definitely enjoyed uh scrapping every minute of that although it was rough in the moment uh there's there's something about that that grind that really gets you feeling good absolutely since we've spent some time talking about wrestling and you mentioned really loving MMA and wanting to coach MMA in the future we've seen DC Cormier retire and he's always gravitated more towards wrestling. He still coaches wrestling. He might do some MMA, but it looks like he's going to do more coaching wrestling because that's kind of what he loves. But you mentioned coaching MMA. What do you like or wanting to be around MMA? What do you like about the add-ons, the things that are added on to MMA? Because it has a wrestling base in many people, but what do you like about MMA that maybe wrestling didn't provide for you, doesn't have as a coach or as an athlete? Yeah, well, to be honest, I don't think it's even that MMA is adding on something. I think wrestling is just without it, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of different elements. Um, wrestling is, is a good way to, to work on certain aspects of MMA um, rather than like it's, you know, wrestling with punching and jiu-jitsu, I guess. And I was one of those guys, oddly enough, I was a wrestler coming up through Ohio where everybody starts when they're five years old. I started halfway through high school and I actually got – into wrestling from jiu-jitsu. I did jiu-jitsu before I ever wrestled. I got my blue belt when I was like 16, and then I uh, had a guy who was like, dude, your takedowns are garbage. Why don't you join your wrestling team to help your jiu-jitsu? And there's something about wrestling, that physicality that I didn't get in jiu-jitsu, and I was like, ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue this for a while. But my end goal was always MMA. MMA was always my dream. That was always my focus. And I really love it. It's, it's fighting, and I think that's the purest, you know, level of competition. And best way to kind of get in there, uh, obviously with rules, so there's some sort of safety and it's some longevity to it. You can train it um, outside of, you know, fight just ripping each other's eyes out. But I love the sport of it. I love how multifaceted it is. You can work on so many different things. There's so many areas for growth. And I, I really think the coolest thing is that it's a new sport and it's being innovated all the time. So I want to be on the, the leading edge of that. I want to I want to be a part of that growth in that process and develop fighters in that. Sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but, uh, you know, well, I, very, I love the sport. It's a very good answer to point out the fact that you're right. That wrestling or boxing or Muay Thai, they're not without anything. They are a complete sport within themselves. It's just that MMA allows people to combine. And like you say, it's a pure – because if you're in a – and I've, you know, I've cornered – kickboxing fights where they're not allowed to knee, right? But it's Muay Thai, but you're allowed elbows, but you're not allowed knees. You're not allowed knees below the clavicle. But obviously at the MMA pro level, it kind of allows more of a diverse. What's mm -hmm. one, obviously you just finished your fight by strike. So what's one strike um, that you really like having or you really like using? Is it your long range jabs and crosses? Is it your close elbows, uppercuts, knees? And don't give away fight strategy. I just mean as yeah. an athlete, who likes to strike? What's a good strike that your feet – like, what do, you, what do you like as far as striking goes? You know what? I kind of gravitate different ways as the fight goes on, uh, as, as my fight camps go on and my career goes on. Before, I would tell you, like, oh, I love this punch or this kick or this strike. But I just like being able to generate some velocity and hit the guy. 
I don't care whether that's a jab, a cross, a hook, an uppercut. I want things that are viciously and violently done and it's hitting a good target. Um, I'll take what I can get, whatever's open, whatever he gives me. I just want to explode through it. And that's my favorite thing to do is just generate that, that force and, and, and set up my moment to do that. Absolutely. Well, that's a, that's a great answer. We didn't give anything away for your upcoming opponents. <laughs> also, I think striking can get problematic if people only want to land a certain strike as their favorite or their most. And since you mentioned uh, your philosophy in striking, are you switched? Do you flow between the two stances? Um, or are you somebody that really um, feels most comfortable in only one stance? You know, it's something I, when I started, um, I did a lot more southpaw stuff and I kind of gravitated towards it as I had different coaches doing different things. But now something I'm uh, starting to flow between a little more fluidly, um, getting a little more diverse on both stances. And uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I see myself in the future being, uh, being definitely out of both a lot more often. Well, that's, that's a great thing. I think that's going to be, there might still be some purists that stay in one stance, but I think as you watch MMA evolve, a lot of what happens is the, um, the things that connect towards each other. Like if a kick lands, what do you do after that? Do you pull it back and reset? Or do you kind of slide the leg down and potentially go from a different standpoint? You see a lot of those chaining that happens in takedowns that there was a time where people just shot from a distance and now it's like GSP really, I think in many ways, brought up the value of striking into takedowns as opposed to mm -hmm. just takedowns. So as you see MMA evolving in the future and being a fighter that wants to innovate as well as a coach, what do you think is maybe a direction that MMA will head in the future that it's not there yet? Where is it going to head? I think you're going to see a lot more people with more diversity and more well-rounded styles. And I'm not talking about guys who are good at jiu-jitsu and are good at striking and good at wrestling. I'm talking about guys who not even just blend them well, but they just have an art that they're dangerous everywhere. And you have, there's guys who are like that now, but I think you're going to see people with less and less weaknesses and holes in their game. Uh, my goal is to be a complete fighter. I've spent a lot of time. I've known always I've had certain strengths, but I built my weaknesses up because I'm not trying to get exposed by guys later on. Yeah. I think the best guys are going to be guys who are good everywhere. They have no weaknesses. And then just trying to, uh, to, to beat those guys are, is going to be the challenge. And I think that's where the sports got ahead for, for guys to be consistent in performance. Otherwise, you get these guys who are on three fight win streaks, three fight losing streaks, three fight win streaks. You know, and they, you got to be good enough to be able to adapt mid-fight. You got to be – have the, the versatility and tools, I guess, to, to handle every situation. And I think you'll – I think that's the future. Absolutely. I think one of the things that's been a big storyline of a lot of MMA fights up till now probably stopped being just focused on this a couple of years ago. But really, the, you know, the striker versus the grappler or the – Muay Thai guy versus the boxer. And in, in many ways, it, it narrates very well when you're watching a UFC fight. If they say, oh, if the person can get it to the ground, then they're in that person's world. Whereas what you're saying is, what if the person you're fighting, every world is their world? Like you want people to fight you and recognize that Adley Edwards, if you're on the feet, that's his world. If you're on the ground, that's his world. If you're takedowns that says well right is that is that kind of where you want to be my thing is it's not if you're on your feet it's not and you're on the ground it's if you're in the cage with me you're in trouble that's what i wanted to be i want to be dangerous in there that's where i'm good not not in a specific place not you don't want to you don't want me anywhere if we're in the cage together you're in danger and that's not where you want it and that's i think where fighting should be because it's a fight we're not doing jujitsu until you you know somebody you can't take them down or, or whatever it is yeah. or you're striking unless you get taken down it's we're fighting, and I'm fighting you everywhere. Can I throw a little shade at the jiu-jitsu butt scoop? Are we allowed to? Um, Go for it. Go okay. for it. All no, day, baby. When, <laughs> and, and here's the thing. When jiu-jitsu tournaments exist and have the rules, the, the jiu-jitsu butt scoop makes a lot of sense. You know, it reduces damage. It reduces risks. But I do think there's an aspect of every um, martial arts where when you limit things, you, you allow loopholes to be created where people, 100%. exactly, people create a style that works for that, which is wonderful for them. But I think that quote that you said that you're in trouble if you're in the cage with me, because it's not about, it's not a matter of being in a certain situation. It's just 
being in a fight is going to bring everything out of me as opposed to people that their skill sets are really in certain subsets of MMA. And for you as a coach, you said you train beginners. If you train a beginner who says, I don't want to learn MMA, I just want to learn fill in the blank, whether it's wrestling or jujitsu for you because you have that background, do you try to get them to consider MMA or do you focus in on a subset or a, a sport of themselves? You know, it's tough. I think you got to take each person as they are and not everybody has the ambitions to be an MMA fighter or be a fighter or be tough or whatever it is. Some people just want fitness. Some people just want to learn some, a new hobby. So I think you got to slot people where they are. Mm. But if I have somebody who's like, hey, man, my goal is to be a UFC champion, but I only want to work on my jiu-jitsu, I'll be like, dude, we got to talk about that philosophy or you got to find a new coach because um, I just, yeah, I don't see eye to eye on that. So given that background, have you had people that think, and having trained MMA fighters myself, I love the attitude, which is just, oh, I'll knock them out. Then I won't have to go on the ground with them. Or like you were saying, oh, I'll just get on the ground with them. And then I won't have to fight. I won't have to uh, stand with them. You, you said you kind of have a, a very direct conversation with them and you don't want somebody to be an MMA that only can really win in one area. Is that what you're saying? You don't want somebody with, one skill set? I, I just think they're limited. But I mean, if you find somebody, if, like I haven't had a situation, but if you get somebody comes in, they're like, hey man, I'm at the tail of my career. This is all I do. You got to take it as it is. But if uh, you're talking about a beginner coming up, sure. I think um, you're going to put them at disadvantage, especially where the sport's headed. This isn't UFC one anymore. You know, <laughs> somebody who's never seen jujitsu, someone's never thrown a punch. Like you got killers out there and you're going to put your guys in danger if they don't know how to set up their takedowns with strikes. And they're going to be in danger if they don't know how to get up when they're taken down um, and all those in-between areas. It's, uh, it's different. I think uh, they're going to be in trouble. Now, they don't have to be great at every single thing in every single place. I mean, there's too much in the sport to be perfect at everything. But you got to be, you got to be good enough to be dangerous, to be competitive, to, to bring something to the table everywhere. Sure, absolutely. I think that it's a great mindset. You've been really showing – your, your mindset as both a fighter and a coach, because if, if the legendary Damian Maya walked into your gym, who's 41 years old, um, where he is in his career, he, he can be a jiu-jitsu guy. Now, he's developed other things, but I think he's in many ways a great example of somebody who's at the tail end of being able to be kind of one skill set. And obviously, he's had a wonderful career, and hats off to him. He's a legend, and he's great. And I think his attitude has always been respectful and wonderful. But there's certainly been times in his career where his strength became a weakness because of other, because of the other well-roundedness. Um, yeah. And I, I certainly, I respect him. I think he's a great example of somebody that's made a very good career out of one skill set and tried to learn other things, but there's yeah. been issues with that. To his credit, I think he was kind of on the forefront. He was somebody who came in with one skill set, and he right. learned how to strike to set up his wrestling. Right. Yeah. His striking and his wrestling is underrated for someone who's got such a strong jiu-jitsu base and came in, I'm guessing, probably yeah. with not as much. Without it, without it. Not. So looking back as we wrap up, looking back to your fight here in November 6th, um, what, are you, what are you still looking to accomplish in your camp uh, as far as physically? Like, are you looking to – to peak again? Are you looking to maintain? Kind of what do you still want to accomplish in the next three and a half weeks? Uh, then you got a weight cut. So where kind of are you with that? Yeah, weight cut's easy. I already, when I, as soon as I took the fight, I made sure my weight was down there. I say low because again, I'm waiting for the UFC to be like, hey, you want to fight in two days? I'm ready. So I'm not worried about my weight cut. I'm real disciplined with my diet. I'm going to get another peak uh, and, and be sharp, explosive, be ready. Um, uh, I'm right on track. Everything's looking good. Everything's aimed up well. I think uh, the guy, the nice thing is the things we've been prep, prepping for the last 18 months all fit with this guy perfectly. We don't have to make very many modifications. So it's an easy adjustment. I've got uh, new coaches that I've been, I've kind of settled in. When I first moved to North Carolina from Ohio, you know, I didn't really quite have my team together. And um, I've slowly over the years here been able to build up, you know, my, the, the, the dream team, I guess if you will, the, the right mixture of coaches and training partners and environments. And I think we've got the winning formula right here. I just uh, uh, started making – Marcus Davis, I'm sure you guys know the, him, the Irish hand grenade. He's an old vet, and he's been helping me over the last few years, but especially these last, you know, this summer, since COVID, really, we've been 
training all the time together. And he's such a wealth of knowledge. I've got a lot of really good coaches coming in together and just, just making it work. We're, we're, we're going to do some big things here. Well, absolutely. You mentioned Marcus uh, Davis and a few other people. Who are your main coaches or people you want to thank? I think a lot of times when people watch MMA, they see Adley Edwards and they think, oh, Adley's doing all that. And certainly you are. You're the guy in the cage, but you yeah. have an entire team, your wife, your kids, your coaches. So I don't ever want to end the interview without giving you the opportunity to thank the people that aren't seen. Yeah, I appreciate it. It definitely takes a village. Um, and luckily, this this area I'm in in North Carolina, there's a lot of cross training. So I get a lot of guys from all over the place. Um, I can't even almost thank a single gym, really. Obviously, 36 Chambers where I'm at is, is my home base, but I've got guys all over. Marcus Davis has been doing a ton for me. Josh Brackett, uh, he's helped me for my last like three or four fights. He's been awesome. Really helped me my Muay Thai. Uh, Brandon Gardner, Clayton Mello, great jiu-jitsu guys. And I've had so many good training partners from all over state. I can't think, I don't want to thank any one of them to take away from any of the others. I mean, everybody's been great. We've got a fantastic uh, a coalition of guys coming together and we get quality work in. I think uh, there's gonna be a lot more big names coming through North Carolina here soon. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I can't wait to see you perform on November 6th against Lance Lawrence for the belt for Hard Rock Cafe, Hard Rock Cafe, Hard Rock <laughs> MMA. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on the show. <laughs> Best wishes to you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Luke. Thanks for having me, man. Take care. Absolutely. Take care. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.